200 miles above the earth. It's a world without borders, seemingly without worries. But after 30 years of observing, we've seen ominous changes down below, evidence that the planet is warming. There is one place on Earth which could provide the answer, Antarctica. And that large rectangle could be the most intriguing evidence yet. In 2000, it broke off the Ross Ice Shelf, the largest iceberg we've ever seen, as big as the state of Connecticut. So big, it could supply the United States with all of its water needs for five years. It was like a giant billboard with secrets written all over it, but no one could get close enough to read it. Never tell that to a scientist. The smell of adventure was in the air. A special team began the journey toward Antarctica. The journey would be treacherous. The route, the same one that Shackleton and Scott took 100 years ago, that alone gives pause for concern. But they could be the first to explore the largest iceberg we have ever known. They prepared to dive inside the giant, into caves and crevasses, and explore its edges, where the dynamics of change are most apparent. The expedition would harken back to the age of exploration, when once again, scientists test themselves against extreme conditions, in search of knowledge which could help unlock the mysteries that challenge planet Earth. This is the port where many South Pole explorers have embarked. Those thoughts are fresh in the mind of the expedition leaders. Dr. Greg Stone on the left is from the New England Aquarium, and Dr. Porter Turnbull will be the ship's medical officer. This will be their longest sea voyage to Antarctica yet. And the first aboard Braveheart a research vessel, not an icebreaker. They're not anticipating big ice flows in the South Pole summer. Captain Nigel Jolly readies the crew for the 12-day crossing, notorious for being one of the most difficult in the world. We're going to talk about man overboard. We're going to talk about where you go to muster. We're going to talk about survival suits. We're going to talk about life jackets. 18 expedition members will spend the next two months on board. Hey, come on. Hey. hey. Yeah, perfect. Hey, oh, there. Yeah, there we go. Let's go to Antarctica. When Shackleton planned his expedition in 1909, it said he advertised in the Help Wanted section of the London Times. Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete boredom, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. Dr. Greg Stone would have applied immediately. In a lot of ways, this trip is very much like a 19th century voyage of exploration to the Antarctic. We have a very specific destination, which is a large iceberg. But beyond that, our science and our observations will be what we encounter. We'll have the ability to follow our noses. We'll have the ability to let the Antarctic Ocean show us the way. The way toward perpetual daylight at this time of year. It's a big hop from New Zealand to Antarctica, 
2,400 miles. It's shorter by plane, but you miss all the fun in between, along with plenty of science. Heading nicely towards Campbell Island. I wonder how far off we are. One of our major objectives to going to Antarctica was to find right whales, find out where they, they feed in the summertime in the Antarctic. But we found them on the way to Antarctica, in the middle of the ocean here. And we, we biopsied one and we found more of it. And this is just, it's really an incredible discovery. It's one of the missing pieces in the right whale biology is the lost right whales of the summer. And I think we found some of them right here. It looks quiet enough so far. Does it get worse than this? Below decks, a first meal begins with a toast. Here's a toast. The successful expedition down and back to B-15. All right. Cheers. Cheers. They skirt Campbell Island, headed out to sea and a target of ice that measured at birth 4,500 square miles. It's time for a final checklist. And it's a good thing. They make a frightening discovery that could threaten achieving the goal. Salt water and electrolysis have dissolved the helicopter's electrical system. Wes Skiles, the expedition's co-leader. Captain's orders, we've got to get the helicopter completely back together uh, before we can leave port here at, at Campbell Island. I don't think uh, anybody in their wildest imagination uh, thought that this would be the helicopter repair <laughs> Nor that Wes would be doing helicopter maintenance. He's an expert diver and cameraman. It does raise a worrisome question. If they need the chopper, will it work? The last piece of land passes behind them. As they begin the journey south, to the fabled continent of Antarctica. And immediately there's an answer to the question, does it get worse? This is not unusual. It will be like traveling from Florida to California at 10 miles per hour, while being whipped by mountainous seas and gale force winds. This is the only place on Earth where storms can travel around the Earth without a landmass to slow them down. These are the latitudes known to mariners as the Roaring Forties, the Furious Fifties, and Screaming Sixties. The expedition will get a chance to learn firsthand just what that means. I know we're only halfway across. That I find that a bit disturbing considering how long we've been traveling already. <laughs> I figured by now you guys would be running IVs to keep me alive. I knew that it was possible that, and likely that we'd get hit with 30, 40, 50 foot waves. But until one of those things hits the boat and slams you up against the bunk and hits you in the pit of the stomach, you really don't have an idea what it feels like. Anything can happen. We're very exposed. We're in the middle of the Southern Ocean. We need to survive these seas. You don't get this experience flying to Antarctica. Finally calm down a little bit, let's go. It gives scientists an up-close look at the environment. Whenever possible, they're on deck, confirming what satellite photos have shown. Amazing how long it takes. It's a two-week journey. Yeah. Flat out, and that's, that's with reasonable weather for these parts of the world. Reasonable weather being gale conditions almost every day. Yeah. 12 days at sea in roller coaster conditions. 
without a rest day and night. Then one morning, they wake up to an ominous sign. It's supposed to be icy near Antarctica, but this much is early, and the Braveheart is not an icebreaker. If the seas freeze too early, she's in trouble. They'll have to negotiate around the bobbing slabs of sea ice. The good news is that they've done it. They have crossed the Southern Ocean. They say the two high points of polar exploration are the first day you see the ice and the last. Antarctica is the fifth largest continent and contains 90% of the world's ice and most of the world's freshwater reserves. It's covered in a massive dome of glacial ice rising thousands of feet. Glaciers made of freshwater created from hundreds of thousands of years of snow accumulation. The ice dome makes Antarctica the highest continent and the lowest because the tremendous weight of the ice depresses the land surface below sea level. If the ice dome melted, sea levels around the world would rise over 120 feet. B-15 was part of the ice shelf before it broke off. That's not unusual in itself. Giant icebergs are forming every day. But it's called Godzilla for a reason. Is it more than coincidence that the largest iceberg we've ever seen breaks off when global warming is an issue? That's the kind of question the scientists would like to answer. Braveheart has made it this far safely. Now the rough stuff begins. Near the continent, one of nature's worst surprises, a catabatic storm. When the chilling upper level winds meet the warmer ocean, a blizzard can blow up in minutes and last for weeks. It was a storm like this that killed Sir Robert Scott and his entire party on their return from the South Pole in 1912. Well, this is it. The famous Antarctic southerly gales that blow persistently over the continent. Now we're here amongst the great icebergs, and these winds are one of our big obstacles. They are literally held in place by wind. Today, we have stopped because we keep trying to get further south and we're not getting anywhere. We've been three times through the ice and come to a brick wall. So we're now putting the helicopter in the air so the helicopter can fly over the brick wall to see whether there is open ocean behind. New Zealander Laurie Prouding is the pilot. At least he'll try to get it into the air. For a start, we'll just be flying high and uh, checking out, see if we can find a decent lead to get through this pack ice. So it might just take a couple of flights before we get right into it and start searching further afield. He acts as if all is well inside the chopper, but no one else is as confident. I just don't know if we're going to make it or not. The wait for liftoff is tense. Cautious at first, the repairs seem to be holding. Ah, oh, God, I can see plenty. I can see hills. Oh, bloody big iceberg. Looks bloody great from up here. Oh, I just don't want to come down. <laughs> Maybe because he'll have to tell them this is what he sees. There is no clear blue water ahead of us. There's ice everywhere. You can see as far as the horizon goes, you see ice. There's nothing to do but move slowly ahead, using the same strategy those first explorers used, studying, watching, trying to avoid ripping open the hull by getting trapped in the pack ice.
I'm worried. We're a long way from any, any other assistance, any help. We're in an area that has some of the worst weather in the world. We're surrounded by pack ice and it's bitterly cold. Biggest fear right now, or biggest concern for me, is strong wind that's gonna push this stuff together. The winds change, and all the broken ice starts getting pushed back together again. And if that happens, we don't have the power or the strength of a hull to push that open again. I don't know whether to try and break through to that next one or not. We're in a race against time. Get out of this area of the pack before it closes in even more. We've launched the helicopters out looking for a way out. Got two small skiffs in the water that are trying to push us around. And we feel real urgency because the, the open water is shrinking as we go through it. We've uh, gone beyond the capabilities of this boat. We're having to turn around. It's not good. Braveheart is locked up in a river of ice flowing at three knots northwest. That's away from B-15. And there's one more complication. They're running low on fuel. We worked out this morning just how much we've spent on fire still, and it tells us we've got eight more days. Eight days. Maybe they should just turn back now. There is something unusual here. It's the middle of the Antarctic summer, and the pack ice should have moved north out of the Ross Sea by now. Doesn't look like global warming from here. They decide the best thing to do, maybe the only thing, is to wait out the ice migration. Find a place to tie up for a while. The chopper begins the search for a safe haven. Then, like the Matterhorn appearing suddenly above a ghost world, glistening blue and white is an ice palace. They'll call it Patience Camp, in honor of Sir Ernest Shackleton's famous endurance expedition. They need the rest, and it's a good place to test new equipment and procedures for the primary mission, to study ice and how it affects the rest of planet Earth. It will be the first time in extreme cold for Paul and Jill Heinrich using rebreathers. These are closed circuit mixed gas diving systems that allow a diver to filter his own air supply and stay underwater longer. I, I think scientifically we're able to contribute a lot. I think with our technology and our, our zest for exploration, we're able to go places where the scientists can't necessarily reach. Um, we can bring them back information uh, that's interesting, samples, and uh, allow them to study and, and pose further questions for us to explore. Well, I feel that uh, we definitely uh, can show to the scientific community that this technology that we're wearing on our back is, uh, is available and can be used to further science. It's a bit like astronauts suiting up for a walk in space. They're going into an alien world where there is no oxygen, depending on technology to keep them alive under extreme conditions. The diving is, uh, is about as extreme as it gets.
ice diving in Antarctica in a distant location, you're dealing with frozen regulators, you're dealing with frostbite, you're dealing with the possibility of losing a diver underwater and trying to find them in the open ocean. You've got pack ice drifting around. The diving is definitely on, the, uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, it's a 10 plus. The first discovery is a dangerous downdraft that tries to pull them further into the depths. It's scary, but they wouldn't have known about it without diving. It's a first clue to the impact icebergs have on ocean water circulation and chemistry. The divers release a vivid, innocuous green dye to trace water movement. Topside, Dr. Stone measures salinity, temperature, and chlorophyll of the water around the iceberg. It's like taking the vital signs. The chlorophyll tells him how rich the microscopic plant life is. The temperature is around 28 degrees. But even in this cold water, the iceberg appears to be melting because the instruments show pools of pure fresh water in the ocean surrounding it. With the ability to recycle their own warm breaths and wearing electrically heated suits, they can resist the cold to stay down longer. Each recycled breath is supplemented with additional oxygen. Deadly carbon dioxide is scrubbed from the breathing loop, and onboard computers cross-check and manage the gas system. As a result, they are able to swim around without making any bubbles that might disturb the marine life. Their dive time approaches three hours underwater. If you had to point to one feature in the Antarctic, it's ice that's the key to almost everything, land and especially in the sea. The ice drives the ecosystem, the ice provides the animals with uh, habitat, the ice provides the animals with food because the sea ice here actually grows the algae that converts the sunlight into energy for the, for the animals to begin the food chain, get the ecosystem going. The growth of algae begins early in the Antarctic summer when the sun starts to shine 24 hours a day. And that's essentially the wheat fields, if you will, uh, if I can use the analogy, those are the wheat fields of the Antarctic, which grow the primary food that the krill, the small fish, and then ultimately the penguins, the seals, and the whales all eat. The only way to study delicate jellyfish is to hand capture them and place them in a specialized chrysal aquarium. It closely simulates open ocean currents. This is a tenophore. Those neon-like lights are cilia, tiny hair-like structures that propel it, like a blimp above a football stadium.
they collect dozens of life forms at Camp Patience to define and describe the science of life around the edge of an iceberg. Looks like the jet boat has some news. While we were waiting at Camp, Camp Patience here, we, we started our science program, did our dives, and we got some new information from a local fishing boat. We now know that we're only 65 miles from the second largest piece of this iceberg, an enormous thing that's 60 miles long and about 22 miles wide. We're all excited about getting there, but there is a little concern about getting stuck in the ice because we're on the edge of what could potentially be thick pack ice. And we just had an expedition meeting and we all agreed that it was worth, worth heading off from here. So it's a mixture of joy, excitement, and intrepidation as we head off from this point. It's February 3rd, and despite the fact that the pack ice appears to be thinning, there's still an abnormal amount of it blanketing the Ross Sea, the thickest in many years. We're out of here. We've left the iceberg, Cape Patience, and we're headed for B-15, we hope. But what seemed clear near Camp Patience has changed very quickly. Braveheart finds itself held fast, remembering the ill-fated Shackleton expedition when they said, what the ice gets, the ice keeps. Time for a different plan. They are so close to Godzilla, B-15. Could they fly there? You're going to essentially have to file a flight plan with us. Right. And then we're going to have to have procedures that we go through if, if you don't fulfill your flight plan. So what do you think? You ready to do it? You comfortable with this, Laurie? Yeah. OK. At dawn, the weather's clear. It'll be a good day to fly. There's a quiet on deck just before takeoff. Laurie will get them there. Wes will make sure the world knows about it. They will have to cross a long expanse of open sea, knowing there is no chance Braveheart will be able to reach them through the ice. Something's wrong. Under maximum load, the balance is off. It's too hard to fly. Laurie makes some adjustments, and we'll try again. It's a gamble. But if they make it, they'll be the first to get close to the largest iceberg in history. For the crew left behind, it will definitely be a long wait. Laurie, there's a lot of uh, rotor interference with the transmission now. You are um, becoming a lot harder to hear. Hey, Laurie, this is Braveheart. Do you copy? You still there, Laurie? Lori, this is Braveheart. Do you copy? Over. Yep. Let me get ready to dive. He's gone. Excuse yep. me. It's a reach, 60 miles over ice flows and blue water, with no safe port below. And then, like a continent looming up from the sea, there it is. And neither Wes nor Lori are prepared for the sheer immensity of B-15. Now they know why it's called Godzilla.
And they may have done more than Wes realizes. The visit will help answer an important scientific question. Greg Stone theorizes the strong ocean currents that move around this giant encourage ocean life along its edges, in effect creating a new habitat. But further out in the Ross Sea, plankton seems to be decreasing. Why? They'll try to answer that with another look after refueling. Laurie finds a landing spot carefully, like the first moon landing. Clean jerk me. Laurie must keep the chopper hovering while Wes goes out to the edge. If anything goes wrong, Laurie will have to lift off with Wes dangling below. He's right on the edge of the cliff, that boy. It's hard to imagine we could only see 10% of the iceberg. The other 90% is underwater, extending down below 2,200 feet. One piece of ice as big as Rhode Island. OK, did you have a good time? Bloody great. Bloody uh, great. Yeah. Had an incredible time. We were at uh, B-15, South 72, 38, West 177, 44. First human beings ever to be here. <laughs> Way to go, buddy. All right, hand her in and we'll go. They'll take one more pass for science. It appears Dr. Stone's theory is right. Currents around the edges create a habitat for ocean life. But the same currents have pushed pieces that break off B-15 away into the Ross Sea. Scientists Kevin Arrigo and Gert Van Jeken from Stanford University have reported an overall decrease in plankton productivity in the Ross Sea. Could it be that B-15's pieces of ice floating freely and forming packs out of season are preventing the summer sunlight from getting into the water to create algae and then plankton? That could be the reason plankton seems to be decreasing. The pack ice has also prevented Braveheart from getting through which makes the tiny helicopter a victorious explorer. Most precious thing I have seen on this trip. It's been a long wait. But this is what exploration is all about. The expedition is uncovering the dynamics of icebergs by looking at the largest ever recorded in all its pieces. But they have not made a direct connection with the global warming yet unless rising temperatures and melting cause B-15 to break off the Ross Ice Shelf in the first place. Although the Braveheart will race for home, it will pause long enough for the underwater research, somewhere along the continent. After being on board for more than a month, firm footing will be welcome. Just off Cape Hallett, a surprise encounter. We have a whole pod of killer whales now, and we're all very excited about this because we're able to begin doing our DNA sampling with this rifle. We brought a specialist on board, Carlos, who's a, a molecular biologist, and these are the first samples of killer whale DNA ever taken from this part of the world. Other people in the Antarctic right now are killing whales to try to understand more about them. We've chosen to use a biopsy dart instead. It's a very small sample. It does not hurt the whale. The whale lives and carries on, and, and the effect of the biopsy dart is, is insignificant. Carlos, you did it! Yes! <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right.
course set for Cape Hallett, on the edge of mountains in the fog. Here they will get the opportunity to complete their study of iceberg ecology by diving under a grounded iceberg. City Hall has sent a delegation. There's time ashore for some diplomacy and to marvel at the magical light of the approaching winter. Oh, that's wild. It's turquoise and magenta. Yeah. Wow. From 24 hour sunlight, this world will transition to 24 hour darkness. Finally, the dive team selects what appears to be a crevasse, which will get them deep inside an iceberg close to shore. Their rebreathers will be put to the test. Their life depends on the technology on their back. In cave diving, survival is measured not in seconds, but in breaths. Ashore, Braveheart scientists use the time to watch a rookery of penguins, while a team nearby watches for the return of Jill and Paul. Just had a real scare here. The guys have been iceberg cave diving, and they went in well over a thousand feet on the other side of the iceberg. They're overdue, but knowing they had plenty of time with their rebreather system, they decided to follow a tunnel to the other side of the iceberg. It was a risk. They might not have been seen to be picked up. But all is well, and this rare look inside an iceberg is exactly what they've been looking for. They'll go back in the morning. There are no sunsets or sunrises in an Antarctic summer, just 24-hour daylight in rich hues. Jill and Paul will be joined by Wes Skiles for the next dive. It will be the payoff for the trip. So we're uh, here at Ice Island Cave Number 4. Um, by far, this is going to be the most dangerous and risky dive of our trip, but one we're looking forward to making. We're physically going inside the iceberg. It's incredible to describe the feeling of, of being encompassed in ice, but it's also a, a feeling that you're out there on the virtual limit of mental, physical, and, and technological limits. They're going to be going in the crevasse that you can see just behind me over here. And that leads right down to the bottom of the iceberg. OK, that's the last diver. Now the wait begins. The clock is ticking. Nineteenth century South Pole explorers certainly did not see this. An immense cavern in the ice that drops deeper into darkness. If only 10% of an iceberg is above the surface, now's the chance to prove it. That will mean this fissure could be 400 feet deep. But at 130 feet, a surprise. 
The iceberg is grounded on solid Earth. And there's something else. It looks like this iceberg has been here for about three to five years, creating a haven for marine life to grow. And what a garden. The strong currents funneled through the tunnels and crevices are rich in tiny plankton that have fed this community at amplified rates. It has created a wonderland. Feather duster worms, sponges, an isopod life form. Some will be identified back at the lab. An exciting discovery inside an ice cave, inside an iceberg. Scientists looking for life on distant planets search for water, even frozen seas, under the most extreme conditions, thinking they may be the best place to find life. This is clear evidence why. But the extreme cold is testing their limits. Still, it's hard to leave. The water is minus 1.6 centigrade. It can't get any colder than this or it would be solid. It's definitely time to go. They are 800 feet inside the iceberg and feel a shift in the current. The same flow that feeds the bottom life has picked up. It's flowing harder. The problem is, it's flowing into the cave. The huge systems on their back create a serious drag, requiring much more energy to swim against the current. And they've already been done for one hour. A long dive in Antarctic waters is 30 minutes. Considering they'll have to decompress before they surface, how long will they be able to survive the freezing temperatures? As they reach the great entry fissure, the current is even stronger, and Wes signals to Paul. The high-definition camera is holding him back. Jill is struggling to make any forward motion. They've been down 85 minutes, and decompression computers are all flashing extreme warnings. Paul helps Wes pull the camera. Slowly, they manage some forward motion about 300 feet until they reach the crevasse where they can ascend. Decompression is a must. The first stop is at 60 feet, holding for 10 minutes so the body readjusts to the pressure. They'll move at 10 foot intervals until they reach the surface. So close, but they have to resist lunging for the surface. Ice anchors will hold them to the ice wall, allowing them to inflate their dry suits and add a thermal space between their body and the life-draining water. It proves to be a critical piece of safety equipment. It's been a magnificent research dive with major discoveries of a new world beneath the iceberg. But physically, it's taken every ounce of energy from these veteran divers. That was a... Holy shit. <laughs> the cave tried to keep us today. That's great. But what was the worst moment? We were glad, you know, to, to make it out the seven, 800 feet that we'd gone in. Uh, against that current and, you know, have had a successful dive. You can call it that. <laughs> it's February 18th, the end of Antarctic summer, which means they must leave within 24 hours. But what they saw down there calls to them. Over dinner, they talk of one final dive, maybe in the morning. And then an urgent voice from above.
The very iceberg they had penetrated is gone, exploding into small bergs spreading out for miles around. This minefield of ice that you see right out here, it was the iceberg we were just filming inside of. And we had just left it, come and had some dinner, and we heard all kinds of screams. And the iceberg we were inside of just disintegrated. This too is a major discovery. No one has ever seen, perhaps even imagined that disintegration could happen so suddenly. The expedition is stunned. Our cave system and everything absolutely is obliterated. That dark blue vertical line leads down 130 foot to the cave we've been diving. The iceberg was old and filled with fissures from years of melting and freezing. As the evening grew colder, the day's thaw was refrozen within the cracks, just as it had been every other night of the berg's spectacular life. But on this night, the tired internal lattice of cracks reached its breaking point and shattered from the thermal shock, just like an ice cube might explode when dropped in a drink. A few hours later, the final message is delivered. The sea is freezing. Everyone knows it's time to go home. They begin their long voyage knowing they not only survived many close calls, but also made significant contributions to exploration and science at the bottom of the world. The expedition wanted to study iceberg ecology and certainly accomplished that. Did they find evidence of global warming? They still don't know if B-15 was caused by warming temperatures. It may have just been time for the Ross ice shelf to calve the monster. But other regions of Antarctica are changing from the heating of planet Earth. And there is little doubt that there will be more giant icebergs floating in our oceans. In the end, we've discovered and learned far more than I ever imagined. And the reason is we were able to combine discovery, exploration, and science, and be open each and every day to what the ocean and what the situation presented us with. This will last a lifetime for me and also open the path for more exploration down here and more science as we move forward in uncovering the secrets of this part of the world.